mention of your name, King of Majesty. There is no power in hell or any who can stand before the power and the presence of the great I am, the great I am, the great I am, yeah, yeah, sing it! Hallelujah, holy, holy, God. Where's everybody this morning? It's good to see everybody here in the cold and the snow. Makes me very happy to see everybody here this morning. song we could ever sing, worthy of all the praise we could ever bring, worthy of every breath we could ever bring, we live for you, oh we live for you, Jesus the name above every other Worthy 
Father God, I thank you so much that we can fill our lives upon the love that you give to us. And I thank you so much for that love. Lord, I thank you that, that we can all be here this morning, uh, that we could trek through the snow and the cold, Lord, that, that we can stand here and, and praise your name, Lord, and we can live our, we can lift our voices and our instruments to you, Lord. And as Jeremy comes up this morning and, and preaches your word, Lord, I pray that, that we can understand the words that he's saying. And, um, I pray that, that we can count on you to stand in the fire with us. We love you. And thank you for loving us. In Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. As you're sitting down, grab your Bibles and turn to Daniel chapter 3. We're whizzing along now. <laughs> Daniel chapter 3. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, that's where we're going to be. I love the last line of that song we just sang, uh, that uh, we will not be shaken. And that's the challenge throughout this whole series has been that in our faith, in our lives, in our daily walk with, with Jesus, that no matter what happens, whether we're facing the flames of a fire figuratively or we're going through stress or whatever we're going through, that uh, we will remain unshaken. This morning's message is called When the Heat is On. How many of you remember that Glenn Fry song, The Heat is On? Anybody? Anybody? <laughs> okay, a few of you. All right. Uh, interesting thing about that song, uh, the uh, Hollywood paid him for that song, to write that song uh, for Bever Beverly Hills Cop? Yes, <laughs> Beverly Hills Cop. I don't have that in my notes. Uh, they paid him $15,000, and it was a throwaway song, and it ended up becoming one of these number one hits, and Glenn Fry lost out, poor guy. Anyway, <laughs> the heat is... If, if you remember the lyrics, he's saying, the heat is on, it's on the street, right? Inside your head, in every beat, and the beat's so loud, deep inside, the pressure's high just to stay alive, because the heat is on. I love those lyrics. Anybody feel like that? The pressure is mounting, and the heat is just getting cranked up, and you just feel like, oh, it's got to give sometime, right? It's really not that old of, an, of a phrase, the heat is on. It began in, in the 30s during America's gangster era. Uh, they, they said the phrase was, uh, it, it described the, how the police were after them. Uh, the heat was on. They're being chased by the cops. Well, later it became known as uh, when police would interrogate you. The heat was turned up. The pressure was on. And, of course, today it means to be under this pressure. The heat is on, and we're faced with so much going on in our lives. Well, in Daniel chapter 3, we see the heat being turned on and being heated hotter, uh, both figuratively and literally. We're going to look at Daniel's buddies, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They're now in their mid-30s. So from chapter 2 to chapter 3, about 15 years plus have passed, and uh, these guys are now middle-aged adults, and Nebuchadnezzar is still the king of Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar is dealing with some ego, and what we find in chapter 3, I think, comes out of his ego. He has this statue built. Well, let's jump in. Daniel chapter 3, let's start in verse 1. It says, King Nebuchadnezzar made a gold statue, 90 feet high, 9 feet wide, kind of after his own image, probably, after his own likeness. And uh, remember his dream that we talked about last week had this image of a statue. So he's got a lot going on. He's feeling very egotistical. But anyway, he sets it up in the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar sent word to assemble the satraps, prefects, governors, advisors, treasurers, judges, magistrates, and all the rulers of the provinces to attend the dedication of the statue King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. So all these guys showed up. And they assembled for the dedication of the statue the king had set up, and they stood before the statue that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. A herald loudly proclaimed, People of every nation and language, you are commanded, when you hear the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, drum, and every kind of music, you are to fall face down and worship the gold statue that the king Nebuchadnezzar has set up. But whoever does not fall down and worship will immediately be thrown into a furnace of blazing fire. Verse 7, therefore when all the people heard the sound of the royal tune, so to speak, they fell down and worshiped the gold statue that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Boy, they just fell right in line. And, and I want to point out a few things that are written in your notes if you have the sermon outline. They won't be up here, but a few things. Some things never change. This, this took place 2,500 or so years ago. And over the course of history, these things have not changed. Number one, 
the world today creates larger than life images for us to worship right now they may not be 90 foot tall statues made out of gold but we have images that are set up that are represented on movie screens and sports stadiums and concert halls internet uh, and sensations and things like that today's idols are represented through actors and athletes and rock stars and things like that and of course the, the the standards are still around right we still have a tendency in america and around the world to worship money and physical beauty and sex and power and fame and influence and pleasure and popularity so all of these things are going on and even though we don't make these 90 foot tall statues we still have images that are being set up for us to worship just as the king nebuchadnezzar had done number two like king nebuchadnezzar we're tempted to create false images of ourselves to impress others now think about this you know we we're not going to create a statue of ourselves but what do we do we go out to facebook and and TikTok and, and uh, instagram in order to build up our images and a lot of times we tend to come across on these social media sites better than we really are if we're really honest right um, and so we have again this tendency just like nebuchadnezzar to create images of ourselves that are there may be false impressions and number three if we decide that we're going to reject the world's images today and take a stand for god people will burn us not literally but they're going to ridicule us and make fun of us and that's what happens in this next section in daniel chapter 3 verse 8 says that some of these chaldeans they took this occasion to come forward and maliciously accuse the jews so what they do is they find out shadrach meshach and abednego are not bowing down guess what their they, their punishment is we got to burn them so they drag them into the king's court and uh, Nebuchadnezzar is irate because they're not falling down to worship this 90-foot idol. Now, how's that for loyalty from your co-workers? <laughs> yeah, let's bring these guys in and have them burned, right? Now, here's the deal. I think in today's world, in the backdrop of, of our text today, you've got three kinds of people, three different kinds of people. You have the stuck-ups, you have the kiss-ups, and you have the stand-ups. All right, the stuck-ups, King Nebuchadnezzar, he's stuck up. He's all about himself and his image, and he thinks he's God, and, and all the whole world revolves around King Nebuchadnezzar. He's stuck up. The kiss-ups are those who, who just fall in line, and they do whatever the king asks. Oh, yes, King Nebuchadnezzar, we love you. We'll do whatever you say, all right? Just fall right in line. Those are the kiss-ups. Now, the, the, the stand-ups, then, are Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They say there is no way we will fall down and worship this idol. While everyone else falls face down and worships, we're going to stand up for what we believe in. We're going to stand up for God, and we're just going to stand up because we know it's not right. Now, the question I want to ask this morning as we go throughout this message, which kind of person are you? Not only that, which kind of person do you want to be? Are you a stuck-up? Are you a kiss-up? Are you a stand-up? Who are you at school? Who are you at work? Who are you with your friends? Who are you with your family? Who do you want to be, ultimately? I, I pray that it's, you'll be a stand-up, all right? But let's talk about what happens. Nebuchadnezzar, he hears about these three employees who don't fall down in worship. He goes into this furious rage. He has them dragged into his court. And if you look at verse 15, jump down to verse 15, Nebuchadnezzar says, Now if you are ready, you three guys, when you hear the royal tune being played, essentially, then you need to fall down and worship the statue I made. But if you don't worship it, you will immediately be thrown into a, a furnace of blazing fire. And who is the God who can rescue you from my power? Now think about this. That's kind of a standoff, right? This is, this is we're going to see, uh, we're going to have a little God contest to see who's going to win. My God or me, essentially, Nebuchadnezzar, or your supposed God. And then when I throw you into the blazing furnace, who's going to be able to rescue you? Come on now. All right? So there's this showdown. The heat is on. How are they going to respond? And, and now think about your life for a moment. How do you respond when the heat is on? What pressures are you facing even now that you're thinking, man, I hope I can just get through this? 
And if you're not facing any pressures right now, if the heat's not on in your life, either you've come out of it, you're in it now, or you're getting ready to go into it. Because it's going to happen where the heat is on, you're, you're facing the furnace of life, and something's going to happen. And so the question is, how do you respond when you're facing the heat? And, and, and so throughout the rest of this message, I want to give you four things. Uh, first of all, that you're gonna, that you should do that these four guys, these three guys did when they were facing the furnace, and the heat, and then four things uh, that happen when we're actually in the fire and we actually trust God. So let's ter- talk first about what we should do when the heat is on. When we're faced with the furnace of life, what do we do? Number one, write this in your notes. First of all, don't worry about defending yourself. Don't worry about defending yourself. Look at verse sixteen. Um, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they reply to the king. They say, Nebuchadnezzar, we don't need to give you an answer to this question. I love that. Because here's the deal. When you're faced with the pressures of life and people are making fun of you, they don't want to hear what you have to say anyway. There's no reason to try to defend yourself before them and even defend your God before them. They don't want to hear it. I, I, I mean... When you're at school or when you're at work, when you're with your friends or family and they turn up the heat on you because you're a Christian or because you took a moral stand for something and you did the right thing because of your faith in God, don't worry about defending yourself. Your actions speak for themselves. And the idea is just to quietly trust God to take care of your attackers. Let him deal with them, right? Because listen, when, when you're in the fire, God is a whole lot better firefighter than you are, (laughs) for sure. Let him take care of it. Don't worry when people attack you, all right? Number two, remember that God has the power to save you. God has the power. We know, we like to say, we throw around this phrase a lot, right? God is able. Yeah, we say God is able. He can do it, right? I love that. Verse 17, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego say exactly, they say, uh, if the God, uh, if the God we serve exists, then He can rescue us from the furnace of blazing fire. He can do it. We believe He can do it. We know our God is able. He's got the power to save us. He can do it. Now, listen. It doesn't matter what kind of mess you're in, what you're facing in life, what kind of crisis you're you're going to get ready to go through. It doesn't matter what kind of difficulty is lurking around the corner of your life or what kind of fire you're trying to put out in your life right now you need to remember that god does have the power to save you and i think for a lot of us that's pretty easy we can sit and and go you know what i know god can do this it's kind of out here somewhere like i know god can do this and that's quite a statement he's able he has the power But I think more than that, number three, we need to believe that God will save us. We need to believe that God will do it. You need to circle that word will. Not just that he can do it, but that he will. The second part of verse 17, these guys say, um, I keep getting lost in my passage here. uh, Yeah, here. 17, they say uh, that God can rescue us from the power of you, the king. He's able to do it, and he will do it, is the sense we get in that statement. That God will save us. Now remember, these guys are in their 30s. They're standing up to the king while everyone else around them is saying, oh, whatever you want, king, we'll bow down, right? They're not kiss-ups. They're not not stuck up. They're they're stand-ups because they're not afraid. They know that God can save them. And they believe that he will save them. Now, this is really important here because when you're faced with whatever situation in your life, you're facing the heat, the heat's turned up, you can't just believe that out here somewhere God has the power to do it. I think you, we must believe that he will get us through. Whatever that looks like, we might, we might be harmed. We might not get through it, as we'll see here in a second, uh, as these guys say. But, but we have to believe that God will get us through in some way. Not that just he can, and it's out here, but it's, it's really real that God can and will do it. Not that he is just able to, but that he will get us through. Number four, when we're faced with this furnace of our lives and we're looking at the fire coming down, ex- we need to express that we are loyal to God no matter what. No matter what happens, <laughs> we're going to stay loyal. 
plain and simple, because that's what Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they conclude their speech in, in verse 18, and they say, you know what, even if God does not rescue us, we want you as king to know that we will not serve your gods or worship the gold statue you set up. We're going to remain loyal to God. Even if we burn up in this fire, we will remain loyal to God to the death. We know he can save us. We know he can help us. We know he can deliver us. We believe he will. But even if he doesn't, guess what? We're not going to change. We're not going to back down. God is God, and you are not. Plain and simple. I want to say this, church. We need this attitude more than ever from each and every one of you. Now more than ever, because the heat on Christianity is getting turned up higher and higher. And and man, I think we're in trouble. If we don't have this attitude of remaining loyal to God, the church will crumble and fall. I kind of like that maybe it's coming to this, because you can read throughout history, anytime the church is persecuted, the church just explodes. It it grows exponentially. So I kind of look forward to seeing what happens. But listen... It's going to get more and more difficult to be a Christian, to remain a Christian, to remain loyal to God. The attack is on. Just turn on the news. We need you, First Church, here in this room, watching online. We need you to take a stand for God, to be loyal to God, because it's going to get uncomfortable. It's going to get difficult from time to time. There may come a time when they're going to drag you out into the streets, and they're going to ask you to renounce publicly that you believe in Jesus Christ. Will you remain loyal? Will you be like Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego and say, you know what, God can save me, God will save me, and I'm going to remain loyal to him, or are you just going to turn your back and fall down on your face like the rest of the world and just be a kiss up and follow right along? I hope that's not the case but that you remain faithful, because God will bless you for doing so. And we'll come, to, we'll come back, to, back to that here in a, in a moment, but let's take a look at what happens next. Verses 19 through 23, they're pretty much saying, oh, this is it. Nebuchadnezzar, he's filled with rage, even more than he was probably, and the expression on his face changed towards Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He gave orders to heat the furnace seven times uh, uh, more than was customary, and he commanded some of the best soldiers in his army to tie up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and throw them into the furnace of blazing fire. So these men in their trousers, robes, head coverings, and other clothes, were, they were tied up, thrown into the furnace of blazing fire. Since the, command, the king's command was so urgent and the furnace extremely hot, the raging flames killed those men who carried Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego up. And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell bound into the furnace of blazing fire. Now, they've faced the heat. Now they're in the heat. What happens, though, when I trust God in the fire? Let me give you the first point here. Number one, when we're in the furnace, when we're in the heat, and the heat has been cranked up in our lives, we need to remember that God walks through the fire with us. He is with us. I love the image we get here, verses 24 and 25. Then King Nebuchadnezzar jumped up in alarm. He said to his advisors, didn't we throw three men bound into the fire? Yes, of course, your majesty, they replied to the king. He exclaimed, look, I see four men, not tied, walking around in the fire unharmed. And the fourth looks like a son of the gods. There's a grace when the heart is under fire Another way when the walls are closing in And when I look at the space between Where I used to be in this reckoning And I know I would never be alone There was another in the fire Standing next to me, there was another in the waters, holding back the sea. Should I ever need reminding of how I've been set free? There is a cross that bears the burden, 
where another died for me, there is another in the fire. I can see the light in the darkness as the darkness bows to him. I can hear the roar in the heavens as the space between where's thin. I can feel the ground shape beneath us as the prison walls came in. Nothing stands between us. Nothing stands between us. another in the fire standing next to me there was another in the water holding back the sea and should I ever need reminded of how I've been set free there is a cross that bears the burden where another died for me there was another in the fire standing next to me there was another in the waters holding back the sea should i ever be reminded of how i've been set free there is a cross that bears a burden where another died for me yeah. Where another died for me. God has promised, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Isn't that amazing? He's always with us. Jesus said in Matthew 28, remember that I am always with you to the very end of the age. He's always with us. No matter what goes on, and maybe when the heat is on, maybe we feel him a lot closer than uh, at other times in our lives. But God is always with us, always. Number two, God can help me come out intact. He has the power to get us through the fire without much harm, maybe without any harm sometimes. But verses 26 and 27 it says that Nebuchadnezzar approached the door of the furnace of the blazing fire and he called out, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, you servants of the Most High God, come out. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out of the fire. And when the satraps, prefects, governors, and the king's advisors gathered around, they saw that the fire had no effect on the bodies of these men. Not a hair of their heads was singed. Their robes were unaffected. And there was no smell of, of fire on them. Isn't that amazing? knowing that that heat was turned up seven times hotter than normal and they survive it and not only that they come out of the fire they didn't even smell like smoke god was on their side god was on their side and he made sure that they came out of this furnace unharmed unscathed and unaffected we got to remember that god does have the power to take care of us that He is on our side, that He can get us through the flames of this life, and that maybe sometimes He's able to protect our well-being so that we come out unscathed. Most times we come out of these fires and tests of our lives, maybe we've learned something, right? Maybe our faith is strengthened, maybe our character is strengthened, uh, maybe we learn a lesson, maybe we are a little wounded or scarred, but God is able to make you unscathed from it. And the best thing, I think, is that we draw closer to God in, the, in these times of fire and trials in our lives. I know the first thing that I do when I am faced with something, what do I do? I go to God. Oh, Lord, please help me. And he and I, we have, we have conversations a lot. I draw closer to him. And so God can help us come out unscathed and intact. Number three, it causes unbelievers to come to God. Nebuchadnezzar is really impressed here. Uh, who wouldn't be? These, these guys escape the flames unharmed. Verse 28, Nebuchadnezzar, uh, he exclaims, Praise 
to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He sent his angel and rescued his servants who trusted in him. Now, I don't know why I didn't include the rest of this verse, but listen to this. They violated, the king says, they violated the king's command and risked their lives rather than serve or worship any god except their own god. Are you willing to risk your lives for Jesus Christ? To lay it all on the line and say, you know what, I don't care if I die, if I have to go through this fire or whatever, it's all for God, and I'm not going to do anything else to fall in line with this world. Are you, are you willing to do that? And really it comes down to, I love that Nebuchadnezzar notices about, about these guys, and that is they trusted in God. They trusted in God. Their loyalty to God once again turns Nebuchadnezzar's attention back to God. I love that how you handle your pain and your agony, how much you trust God through the fires in your life, no matter how much you're under pressure, the way you handle that, I'm telling you, will most likely be your most powerful testimony you can have in your life. How you respond to the flames in your life and the hot furnace in your life, the way you respond, if it's a godly way, will be the best testimony you could ever give to those around you. When the heat is on, and it gets turned up and down. I pray that you'll stand up. Because when you stand up for God and our loyalty, people notice that. And those actions in your life, they could lead people to Jesus Christ. They didn't have to defend themselves to Nebuchadnezzar. The actions spoke for themselves, and Nebuchadnezzar said, Yep, <laughs> praise be to God. It's kind of a neat lesson from botany I want to share with you here. Did you know that some seeds germinate only when there's a fire, a forest fire? Anybody know that? That's kind of a neat story. Over in New England, for example, there's this jack pine cone tree. And uh, on the cones of this pine cone tree, on the cones, there's this resin that is so thick that the seeds are not able to fall out on their own. Only when there's a fire and intense heat will this resin melt off the cones and allow the seeds to drop out. And when they do, they germinate and they produce more Trees, a whole new generation of pine cone trees there in New England. In other words, they grow only after they've been through the fire. Now listen, some of the greatest things that are going to happen in your life are going to come through those fires in your life, whatever you're going through, where God will allow the seed in your life to drop out, germinate, and produce a, a, a new tree or, or whatever. So the fire can be good. Let's look what happens in the rest of our story here in Daniel chapter 3. In verses 29 and 23, or 29 and 30, it's uh, King Nebuchadnezzar says, Therefore I issue a decree that, any, uh, that anyone of any people, nation, or language who says anything offensive against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego will be torn limb from limb, and his house made a garbage dump. For there is no other God who is able to deliver like this. Then the king rewarded Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. When you remain loyal to God, rewards will come. He, God will bless us. Number four, God will reward our faithfulness, not only here on earth, but in heaven, especially in heaven. Beyond our salvation, I want you to know this, beyond our salvation, God will be handing out rewards in heaven. Over in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, Paul talks about this. In, uh, if you look and see what he says in verses 10 through 15 here, he talks about the foundation and how we're building uh, the, these good works in our lives. He says, according to God's grace that was given to me, I have laid a foundation as a skilled master builder, and another builds on it. But each one is to be careful how he builds on it. For no one can lay any foundation other than what has been laid down. That foundation is who? Jesus Christ, okay? So it starts with Jesus, then we build on top of that. Paul says, if anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay, or straw, each one's work will become obvious. People will be able to tell. He says, for that day, for the day will disclose it, because it will be revealed by what? Oh, there's another fire coming. That fire will test the quality of each man's work. If anyone's work that he has built survives, he will receive a reward. There you go. If anyone's work is burned up, 
he will experience loss, but he himself will be saved, but only as through fire. Now, listen, some Christians, hopefully not in this room, they're going to get to heaven by the skin of their teeth. (laughs) Not you. Please don't let it be you. I want you, First Church of Christ, all of us, I want us to get to heaven and be and receive these incredible rewards. How do we do that? What's this gold and silver and costly stones? What's Paul talking about? Let me ask you this. It's, it's this way. How are you investing your Christian life? What are you using to build on the foundation of Jesus Christ? Are you pointing others to Christ? Are you being loyal to Him when the heat is on? Do you serve others with the love of Christ in your life? Do you make a daily investment with God? Saying, man, I'm, I am going to sit down. I'm going to read my Bible and I'm going I'm to pray to Him on a daily basis. I'm going to meditate on what it says in there. Have you made coming to worship a priority in your life? That's the gold and silver, costly stones, the wood. The, hey, those are the things that you're going to be rewarded for when you get to heaven. Are you doing those things? Are you a stuck-up? Are you a kiss-up? Or are you a stand-up? When we get to heaven, I would love to see God handing out all these rewards, incredible rewards to the members of Barbara and First Church of Christ. I'd love to be standing at the gate watching you come through and going, yeah. Let it be so. How do you get them? You need to trust God in the fire. You need to do life His way. And you need, to, you need to care more about what God says than about what this world says. Don't get caught up in the trap here. When you remain loyal to God through the, the fires in your life, you will reap some of the greatest rewards. That's my prayer for you. If you need to give your life to Christ this morning, I invite you to do that. Talk with me after the worship service is over. When the baptistry is ready to go, if you need to be baptized, do that today. Uh, Don't walk out of here without doing that. If you want to make First Church your home church, you can also do that. Talk with me and we'll make that happen, all right? Uh, In a moment, we are going to take the Lord's Supper. And uh, just to remind you, if you would, if you want to take it at the tables, that's fine. If you want to bring it back and sit down and take it, that's fine. But uh, make sure you come back to your seats. Gary will then, after we take the communion together, uh, will come up and give us an announcement. And then uh, you'll be free to go home. But let's go to the Lord in prayer just now. Lord, we thank you again. Uh, for the time that we have in this room to worship you and through music, through the uh, reading of the word, through hearing the, a sermon and, and through this Lord's Supper. God, you're just amazing. We thank you uh, that we can enter your presence and be here today. Uh, just now we take a moment to remember Christ, his body and his blood given for us. We thank you so much for that act of love. In Jesus' name we pray. I want to thank all of you for staying around this morning. Uh, it's a few items we want to go over with you. Now, earlier, or I should say the latter part of last year, you remember, uh, we had told the congregation, Jeremy has accepted a position as minister of the Hilliard Church of Christ. And Hilliard is located on the west side of Columbus. It's a church running about 400 members. One thing that that Russ and I and and Jeremy want to emphasize the fact is Jeremy's leaving us on good terms. Uh, Jeremy has expressed to us that he feels God is taking him in this direction. We had a meeting on Thursday and Jeremy expressed some of the uh, the factors that has led him to this decision. And we hope uh, that he will share those with the congregation before he leaves. Jeremy's been working with Uh, the elders, he's been working with the church staff to try and make this transition as smooth as possible. Now, Jeremy had given us three months' notice. His last Sunday is February 28th, so we're down to the final month. And many of you probably know how the elders work, and we're kind of slow. So we're in the last month. Jeremy is cooperating with us in our search for a replacement, He's worked with us, and he's continuing to work with us. He's worked with us on establishing a job description. We have that that we have put out. There's not a lot of capable young men who are willing to take on a church ministry, as Jeremy did. 
I would ask each and every individual here and those listening today to be in continuous prayer for Jeremy, Don, and his family in the changes that are taking place in their lives. Oftentimes we look at what's happening to us and we say, why us? But we have to understand that Jeremy, Don, and the family are impacted as well, and we need to be praying for them. As well, we ask that you continue to be in prayers for our church. We ask that you continue to know that God will bring us the right person. God will deliver that. We've been through difficult times in the past, and I can remember, uh, and, and some of you would know, I can remember Steve Rector and Ed Rector. And any time we ran into difficulties or we ran into problems, they would always say, God has a reason. It'll all work out. And it always has. We've put together a committee. They will be working with the elders and finding a new minister. We've asked and we continue to ask for your prayers. And one of the big things we ask for is your patience as we search for a new minister. This is not going to happen overnight. It's not going to happen immediately. Dave Fuller will remain our youth minister. He'll remain with us. He will pick up a great deal of the slack that is left behind by Jeremy moving on. Now, I said Jeremy's last day, last day to preach is February 28th. Beginning March 7th, we have guest speakers lined up for six weeks. As well, Dave Fuller will be helping to fill in that gap. We need to work together, all of us. We all need to be in prayer every day for our church. Jeremy said something today in his message, and by the way, I think the message was excellent. It hit home. But Jeremy says God has the power to take care of us. God has the power to take care of his church. We may think that this is the end of the road. We don't know where we're going to go. But God does. God has a direction for us. Is it going to be difficult? Probably will be. But I think each and every member here, each and every person here would say, this is not the first difficulty we've faced, and it's not going to be the last. But one thing we can always do is to rely upon God, rely upon his power, and rely upon prayer. And I thank you for staying. Let me close with prayer. Dear Holy Father, we thank you. We're so very blessed for the time that you have given us with Jeremy and his family. We're so very blessed for the learning that we have had during this time. Dear Holy Father, I pray your presence to be with them. I pray that you will encourage them and deliver them. Dear Holy Father, they go down today to, to look at a house and I pray your presence to be with them in that endeavor. Dear Holy Father, we're so very thankful for the time that you've given to us, the messages that he has delivered to us, your word that he has shown to us. Dear Holy Father, I just pray that as we continue, we know you have the power to take care of us. You have the power to take care of your church. And Dear Holy Father, I know you will. You will take care of each and every one of us. You will find us the right fit. You will bring to us the right person. And dear Holy Father, I thank you, and I pray you will guide, guard, and direct our footsteps as we leave here today, that we may return to praise and worship you. We say this in Jesus' name, amen.